not touch anything. Is it, should, will it be working now? Welcome, everyone. We're so delighted that everyone is here. Um, we're, we're kind of blending groups together. We have many of you who've been with us all weekend for the symposium, and then many more of you who've come out to celebrate um, Harold Jones today with us, and we're so delighted. But it does mean that we're trying to like pull everybody together and get everybody in a seat to make sure if we need to add more Welcome seating, we everyone. can. So please take a seat if you are able. We're so, so we'll delighted that everyone is here. Um, we're, we're kind of blending groups together. We have many of you who've been with us all weekend for the symposium, and then many more of you who've come out to celebrate um, Harold Jones today with us, and we're so delighted. But it does mean that we're trying to like pull everybody together and get everybody in a seat to make sure if we need to add more Welcome seating, we everyone. can. So please take a seat if you are able. We're so, so we'll delighted that everyone is here. Um, we're, we're kind of blending groups together. We have many of you who've been with us all weekend for the symposium and then many more of you who've come out. Okay, um, and if you um, have Jones seats in front of you so um, and you're, and you're willing, please to, like, you know, move in together, together so that we can get everybody, get everybody, everybody seated. And sure I know we've gotten a couple questions that will be addressed so later on in the program, but you've been seat. handed you're some able. pieces of we're paper so and envelopes when you came in the room. We are able to take those at the end of the day, or you can take them away with you, just whatever you're going to be comfortable with. And many more of you who've come out. Okay, so, um, okay, and if you it have like seats got in front of you um, and you're, and and you're willing, please like, you know, move, move in together so that we can get everybody, get everybody, okay. everybody seated. Hi, I'm Meg Haggard. I'm not official part of the program. I'm just trying to get everybody the program, settled. But, but we have, I have a special additional announcement. Um, Terry Etherton from Etherton Gallery has very generously um, told us that he's going to open the gallery this afternoon after the program for folks who were not able to get there yesterday and are interested in coming over. So we encourage you to go and see Land Reform with Mark Klett, Frank Golke, Peter Berman, and Michael, I mean, no, Michael Berman, excuse me, and Michael Malone, and um, if you can't get there, to, oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, if you can't get there today, I think the show is going to be open until March 14th, and it's a beautiful exhibition. Um, I want to welcome to the stage the center's director and Breckenridge Barrett. Good morning. We have had quite a weekend, and now we're bringing more folks um, into, into it. And I, um, I want to say I've been looking forward to this part of the program um, for, I think, over a year, year and a half. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our MC for today's celebration, Peter McGill. Peter McGill is the president of Pace McGill Gallery, which he founded in 1983 with Arnie Glimcher of Pace and Dick Solomon of Pace Prints. One of the world's leading fine art photography galleries, Pace McGill has dedicated, is dedicated to advancing the medium for over 30 years. In this time, McGill and his team have presented over 350 exhibitions and published numerous catalogs on modern and contemporary photography. The New York City Gallery is known for discovering artists such as Nan Golden, Joel Peter Witkin, and Peter Graham, and representing masters such as Irving Penn, Richard Avedon, and Robert Frank, just to name a few. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Peter McGill. Hi, everybody. This this is the fun part of the weekend, as if the previous events haven't been fun. The, the picture of Harold there is not unusual. <laughs> this is not an outlier. Um, and I, in the last uh, uh, segment this morning, um, I just brought up the fact that there is somebody missing here, and I just want to mention him, uh, Victor Schrager, who was the second director of Light Gallery, uh, instrumental in why we are all still sitting here together interested in thinking about light. So 
Um, I'm sorry he's not here, and I'm sure a lot of other people are as well. Um, thank you, Annie, Becky, and your team, uh, including Meg, um, Francis, Murray Jones, and Susan McGill for their great contributions to this program today. Um, I feel I am qualified to be standing here doing this part. Um, I may be one of the few people who knew Harold before he liked dogs. <laughs> um, dogs are currently a big part of Harold and Francis's life. Um, but Tennyson and Fern had a beautiful little black chihuahua named Mighty. And it was common knowledge back at the gallery that, well, so anyway, I'm happy to say <laughs> Beast won the battle over man with, with Harold. Um, I'm also perhaps one of the few people who can say that I'm a surviving veteran of the three events in Harold's life which transformed the world. I worked for him at Light Gallery. I worked for him at the Center for Creative Photography and I was his first graduate student here at the University of Arizona. Um, people say, what was it like? And I, I think of Harry Truman, a Democrat, who said, uh, they say I give them hell. I tell them the truth, and they think it's hell. <laughs> I would not be here without Harold Jones. I've had the privilege over the last 40 years of working for or representing artists such as Robert Frank to Irving Penn, Robert Rauschenberg to Richard Misrak, and Harry Callahan to Ito Barada. I can't tell you what a privilege it's been, and in a sense, a privilege to bring Harold's legacy forward. Harold is provocative, filled with the greatest integrity belief in those around him. He's driven to challenge himself and everybody else who will be challenged. Harold is provocative and short. He's nothing short of a good, you know. No, he's not tall. In short, nothing short of a godlike genius in the photo world. He's a leader, and when he leads people, he never has to look back. We're behind him. I can't thank you enough for what you've done for the field, what you've done for me personally, and we all owe you great thanks. So the format for today is I'll introduce each of the speakers with a story about Harold, which I hope you enjoy. I'll introduce Fern, Annie, and Colin. The first story I'd like to tell about Harold and Light Gallery is I was an intern and we lived in a transient hotel, so I had a couple roommates who claimed that I kept them up a lot of the night saying, Harold, I can't do anymore. <laughs> I'm done. I'll try. I'm doing my best. There was also the day that we came in very early to install Dwayne Michaels' exhibition, the first exhibition of photographs he had, where he made his transformative pictures that told stories, but he also wrote on the pictures. We got the box from Nielsen Frames. Everybody's talking about Nielsen Frames and Harold's quality installations. We opened the box. The metal section frames, 11S, were in the box, but there was no hardware. Harold threw the box across the gallery and said, we'll do it right regardless. So we took the pieces of glass, and you've seen pictures of this installation, and this is not where we wanted to go with the standards that Harold was trying to employ at Light Gallery. We put the pictures behind glass and installed uh, T-pins to hold the glass in place. Several things that are very important to remember. These were T-pins, not nails. Nails are too fat. The T-pins were all cut to a precise length, and the bend was a precise distance from the top of the T-pin to the bend itself. The T-pins were installed parallel to the floor and exactly two inches from each corner of the piece of glass. 
Therefore, we had taken this pedestrian way of photographic presentation and taken it to a new level. The show looked great. Nobody noticed because it was perfectly installed. I can't do any more, Harold. <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to introduce both the storm and the force behind it, Fern Schott. Well, I sat down to write something about Harold, and I decided it, Harold is indescribable. Um, he arrived out of what to me was the blue of Rochester, New York, and Tennyson had faith in this unknown person whom he had hired to run this unthinkable gallery. Um, and very quickly, it was clear that Harold knew exactly what he was doing. He knew who to to sign to contracts. He knew who to hire and who to hire who walked in off the street wanting to be hired, which was another part of the equation. And um, light opened and it went from there. Uh, I grew up in a house that had paintings in it and I went to art exhibitions in London as a teenager but I never expected in my life to be so engaged in art as I have been for now my adult life. And I thank Harold so much for doing that for me, for opening my eyes and for opening the eyes of a lot of other people and for continuing to do so throughout his life. And I'm sure he will for the rest of his life. Um, what is going on behind me? Oh. <laughs> Um, I, can't comp I, I can't compete with what's behind me. But Harold, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I also want to thank Francis, who with bravery and babies, moved to New York to a completely unguaranteed future. I mean, young people now think they have it hard because they won't get jobs for a lifetime. They won't. But Harold and Francis moved to New York with babies with no guarantee of anything beyond a few months. And they, they made a life for themselves in New York, and then they made a life for themselves in Tucson. And as a wife and a mother, my hat is off, Francis. That's about all I have to say. Other people, I mean, you've heard me all weekend. You don't need very much more from me. Thank you. So it's all about storytelling, right? So Francis has a great story about the kids that apparently he, she and Harold would get tired too. And on Saturday mornings, the kids were not tired. They wanted to get up. And I presume you were under a year old because I met you when you were probably under a year old. And Francis had a system for taking care of the kids. <laughs> and that was put them in the playpen in the living room and dump a box of Cheerios on them. <laughs> so it, it is, you know, storytelling, I can't be responsible for the content. This may or may not be true, but apparently, as Francis tells it, not only were they stuck to their hairs, they were, they, the Cheerios stuck to the hair. They said, right, in spite of this, but stuck to their eyelashes as well. And, and fast forward, these kids also then came to help Susan and me in the summers to take care of our children. So, you know, it's, it's family's family, period. Um, when Harold came to the center, um, I was working at a, a little photography gallery in uh, Birmingham, Michigan, having been the, the intern at Light, and uh, making $98 a week. And um, that was serious. That was a, you know, I could pay my car payments and buy some beer. Um, so when Harold came down here, he very kindly changed my life again and asked me if I'd come down here with him to both work at the center and uh, be the first graduate pro uh, student in the graduate program. So one of our um, tasks, or, or Harold, I helped Harold fulfill one of our tasks, and that was fundraising and public relations. And what 
uh, Harold thought is one of the things that would help the center tremendously is if the people in the community of Tucson started believing in what it was that had just landed here, not from Mars, but from the artists themselves. So there was one particular and very memorable uh, fundraising trip we made, or PR trip, because we didn't raise any money, we were just telling people how great the center was, was to a woman in one of the sort of retirement communities um, located outside of Tucson. And we arrived there with great fanfare, and it, you know, to a graduate student, hardworking kid, it didn't look like this woman really even had that much money. Um, and so we go in there, and Harold and I are delivering the news about the center, how great it is, how transformative it will be. Was he right? And her little dog jumped on Harold's lap. <laughs> Remember, this is before Beast won the battle. This dog was on Harold's lap, and it was my turn to say something, so I said something. And Harold was slowly pulling the dog's tongue. <laughs> so this woman's sole companion in life, was sit, sitting there talking to me. I was talking in earnest, and Harold's over here going. <laughs> and the dog's going. Well, that was not a failure. It was one of the funniest times I'd ever had with Harold. So it, it, you know, I think that this weekend and all the good vibes it has created and all the energy that's been exchanged and all the history that's been laid down and all the possibilities for the future that have been talked about, looked at, and will hopefully be employed, uh, sets us up to understand how great the Center for Creative Photography is. Um, so with, with that, I wanted to introduce Annie, who, without whom, I don't think the Center would have such a bright future. And, and, um, I've actually known all the directors of the centers, and I think that, that Annie, you are positioned to do a great job because you are doing a great job. Um, <laughs> she can also fundraise. Um, the, the other thing that I think is really critical about Annie is she understands that this is not an I island here. This is not an entity isolated unto itself. It's an entity that has to be incorporated into the university system and structure, something Harold talked about when he founded the place, but somehow never really happened. Annie has begun and is making that happen. Um, Annie Breckenridge Barrett, listen to this, it's quite something, is a cultural professional with over 25 years focus, of focused expertise in museums, not nonprofit management and the law. Annie currently serves in a dual appointment See, here it comes. As Associate Vice President for the Arts at the University of Arizona and Director of the Center for Creative Photography. So, Annie, it's a very happy moment to bring you up here and, and to your stage, say thank you and, and listen to what you have to say. <laughs> and kids in the back, you should be happy and proud of your mom. I usually just use bullet points, um, but my charge today was to talk about Harold Jones and the Center for Creative Photography. So um, you can ask my husband, I spent quite, a, quite some time writing and thinking. Um, and over the past few days, um, it's, it's morphed into to a lot. But I will say that in preparing these remarks, um, I wanna thank um, Alexis um, who is one of our archivists, and I could not have um, done this without her. And the importance of photography and the importance of community and the importance of archives is um, alive and well. So um, I spent a lot of time in the Light Gallery archive. When I asked Harold what was the most important thing he did as the first director of the Center for Creative Photography, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, I think I brought with me a dedication and belief about photography, photography that startled people and made them curious. Certainly, photographers trusted me with their work, and I appreciated that they had a place, that they had a place to be, which is what I achieved at Light. 
But the big part of my success with the, was that I had the knack for picking great people to work alongside me. Harold came to the Center for Creative Photography in 1975 at age 34. He wrote a proposal regarding his vision for the CCP. He asserted that the CCP must use efforts to secure archival commitments from contemporary photographers such as Callahan, Siskin, Somer, Avedon, Smith, and Heineken. He asserted that the CCP take a holistic approach to collecting and continually search for collections that give an added perspective to the archive to support scholarly research of the entire history of photography. He said that the CCP should collect books, house a darkroom, have a rotating exhibition space, in addition to the archive. He stated that the CCP should interact with students, faculty, and actively program lectures and engage in a dialogue about the history of the medium and the contemporary moment. He said that interviews must be done and histories collected which represent all of those involved in photography. And that special care and attention be given to the preservation of the material housed at the center, including profit, proper storage facilities and best practice. He also asked for a computer upon his arrival. <laughs> Harold arrived in Tucson and got to work. He stayed at the center for only two short years, but during that time, he established connections between the center and the pho photography community from which he came at Light and Eastman House. Many of the photographers named in his proposal readily gave commitments to direct their archives to the center. He set the wheels in motion so the center could collect holistically to ensure that it would be established as a premier research destination for the study of the medium. He pioneered Voices of Photography, the center's oral history program, and he continued working on it through 2018. He then intentionally set the next director up for success. Harold was clear that he wanted to be more involved with teaching and creating and the university responded by giving him a photography appointment in the art department in 1977. Harold believed it to be a logical step and was keen to participate in the development of the photographic program at the university. And he was quick to add that he would take full advantage of the resources at the center. It is to be noted that Harold said at the time, and I quote, of all the various titles I've had, the one that pleases me the most is that of educator. So when I was considering my remarks today, I thought a lot about vision. And um, at a leadership level, we talk a lot about it. Uh, corporations, governments, museums, nonprofits, NGOs, universities, advocacy organizations, they all want leaders with vision. But many times, what results from the intended vision is very different than when, <laughs> what was intended. And we usually hear a lot about that when we're searching for the new leader. Um, my, my point here is that when it comes to the CCP, Harold's vision has become a reality. Now to be fair, over the years, depending on the circumstances and the resources, the road to that reality at the center may not have always been smooth, but the commitment to the vision was never lost at CCP. If we look at what Harold proposed, today we see the center housing, eight million objects representing the life's work of 270 photographers, over 100,000 prints, a library, oral history programs titled The Voices of Photography Started by Harold, not a dark room, but a highly sophisticated digital imaging unit, an endowed conservation lab dedicated to the preservation of the medium, and a few computers here and there. <laughs> and in the past two years, the CCP team has deeply considered our values and what, at this stage, the center's lifespan as an organization we must do to honor the legacy while reacting to the current moment. How we, as Harold put it in an interview with the New York Times about his new CCP appointment, and I quote, how we can see photographs not only as aesthetic and artistic expressions, but as anthropological artifacts that tell us something about our culture. I think if we look at them this way, we might find out about our culture things that we have never suspected. 
And for us today, this means diversifying our collection, bringing it into the 21st century and truly working with contemporary photographers. As was voiced this weekend, there are stories that need to be told and underrepresented photo photographers work that must be examined. It is only when we attempt to tell the complete story of the history of photography that this is possible. The CCP's intent behind the establishment of our new acquisition fund will address gaps identified in our collecting plan and focus on what Harold referred to, and I quote, as the effort to continually search for photography that gives an added perspective to the archive to support scholarly research of the entire history of the medium. Harold's belief about contemporary practice directly relate to the intention behind our new interdisciplinary gallery. He told the New York Times, quote, contemporary photography is really what interests me most because it relates to so many different things, poetry, theater, music, and dance. Harold, I think you will be pleased with our plans for the new interdisciplinary gallery. The amazing team we've put together to program it will work across as many disciplines as they can explore to focus on how photography not only relates to so many different things, but how it can help us learn about ourselves in an ever-challenging world. Harold Jones built the foundation here at the C CCP, and we are committed to honoring your vision. But for your contribution, the center would never be where it is today. Thank you. feel right saying thank you, but thank you. <laughs> it's your house. Um, just one more thing. It's hard to add to what you stated so carefully and beautifully. Um, setting up the incoming director after Harold was, uh, he was helping Jim Enyart, and I don't think it was signed up, but the Edward Weston and Gene Smith archives were teed up because of Harold Jones. That was him. So you had the founding group, the group that was added to shortly after the opening of the center, and on top of that goes Gene Smith. So it was a lateral. I'll tell, a, I'll tell a quick story about Gene. I, I, I was in charge of getting these people around, like picking up Beaumont Newhall at the airport, um, taking care of Gene Smith. It was quite, I actually drove around Miss O'Keefe for the weekend that she was here, along with Juan Hamilton, in the back of Harold and Frankie's powder blue Toyota wagon. <laughs> they were used to, I think, Cadillac limousines. But anyway, and I was sitting there, I was writing my dissertation on Stieglitz, and you know, Ansel is so boring. I couldn't stand it. You know, Alfred always wanted to keep the apartment in New York. <laughs> I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. But, but I was in New Mexico. I thought it was silly for him to keep the apartment in New York. I mean, that's what it was like. So Gene Smith had never stayed probably in a fine hotel in his life. And Harold checked him in, the university checked him into the Arizona Inn. And I think he was there for 10 days. He was supposed to be there for four, and he stayed for 10. <laughs> he liked it. And he had his girlfriend with him, Sherry Suris, who was an overbearing presence in Gene Smith's life, really overbearing, whose job it was at that point in her life to keep Gene from drinking. So when I was in charge of checking them out of the Arizona Inn and getting to them to the airport on time, the entire bar staff showed up to say goodbye to Gene. <laughs> so, The, the, the other thing, and correct me if I'm wrong, one of the things that sort of um, set Harold up to move to the art department is whenever we listed the original people whose archives we housed here, there was a name that always went first. Everything was alphabetical except it began with Paul Strand. So it would read, the list would read Paul Strand, 
Ansel Adams, <laughs> Wynne Bullock, and I don't think that helped the standing uh, in, in Ansel's mind of what Harold was doing because I don't think Paul, uh, that, that I think Paul Strand appreciated, I don't think Ansel could quite understand how anybody could sort of trump his position. Um, there's another person here, and you have to stand up, is Marguerite McGillivray, who is Harold's partner. <laughs> at the Center for... <laughs> so, 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 and Marguerite was, uh, we didn't know if she was a spy from the, pre you had worked in the president's office and directly moved over to Harold's. <laughs> this guy. What's getting started over there. Thank you. See, that's how smart Marguerite is. No, no, no. So thank you, Marguerite, but you absolutely need to be recognized in this, this, this credit. So my, my graduate um, school story is Harold as my mentor for the third time, um, was pushing, I can't do any more, Harold. I'm done, I'm tired, pushing me, pushing me, pushing me to see what kind of creative efforts I could come up with for my master's thesis show which ended up being pictures of thumbtacks, moths on a screen door, and piano keys. So now you know why I went into the gallery business. <laughs> uh, I, I, and Harold and I were talking about this at lunch. I was ambitious, and Harold said, well, it's not bad, we were all ambitious. So my graduate thesis show ended up on the walls of the Tucson Museum of Art. That was something I'm very, very proud of, and it's probably the only major show I ever had in my life, and the last. <laughs> However, strategically, it shows how stupid I was, because my committee were a bunch of very wonderful artists working in the art department, whose job it was to, as I could see it, keep me from graduating, and it was only fueled by the fact that they had all wanted over their decades of service here in Tucson to have shows at the Tucson Museum of Art. I had one. They didn't. Bad move. So they were lying in wait for me. Not only had Harold pushed me to the point of my creative limits, as was his job and my privilege to try, but he tipped me off. He said, these guys are after you. You don't have to come to work at the center for a couple of days. You need to study what's going on in the contemporary art world. So I did. And I got to my orals and answered the slide. The, they put a bunch of slides up on a screen and I got some, most of the, enough like a driver's test. I got enough right to get my license. So I was, I was done. I was out of graduate school. So Harold, not only were you a great teacher you were an incredible friend, and I'm sure that that tradition in your department continued. So with that, I'd like to introduce your successor, Colin Blakely, who said something that causes you to know this is a good guy. I set out to find the beauty and intrigue inherent in the familiar. That's a nice premise, and I'm quoting you. Thank God for the internet. Colin Blakely is a practicing photographer, and he serves as vice president for strategic initiatives at the Arizona Arts and director of the School of Art at the University of Arizona. So we have a photographer now who's not just teaching in the photography department, he's running the art department. Colin directly supervises 34 faculty and 11 staff in a school with approximately 550 majors. When I was here over 30 years ago, I think there are probably a dozen majors. So I don't even think Donald Trump can claim numbers like that. <laughs> so congratulations, keep it going, because the more art students we have, the better place the world will be.
Thanks, Peter. Uh, and while I'm um, getting my remarks ready, I just want to reflect for a moment on, on what an amazing weekend this has been. Uh, and offer, as I'm sure, as I'm sure you all share in this sentiment, my my um, appreciation for the heroic efforts that have been put on by the CCP staff uh, and all who are involved in, in making this such an incredible couple of days. So there are many things that connect all of us who have come from far and wide to participate in this weekend's activities. A love of photography, a connection to Light Gallery, a connection to CCP and the University of Arizona, and of course, for those of us here this morning, a connection to Harold Jones. My direct connection to Harold is perhaps more tenuous than many in this room. In fact, it was only this week that I had the pleasure of meeting him in person. Yet on another level, um, we share a much deeper connection through our engagement with and commitment to a photo program that Harold joined over 40 years ago as the inaugural program coordinator. So in addition to my own love of photography, I possess a fascination for understanding and analyzing structures. Uh, and so as I have again and again visited the Legacies of Light exhibition, I found myself equally transfixed by the amazing photographs in the exhibition and the light community map that has been mentioned so many times this weekend that traces the network of connections to those directly and indirectly involved with light. On this map, there exists in my mind a particularly pronounced line connecting light as the inspiration for this weekend's gathering, the Center for Creative Photography as the destination and host of the gathering, and the School of Art as the place that I have come to know and love deeply over the past four years. This line, of course, represents the path that Harold followed during a particular part of his career. I think it's safe to say that without Harold, this weekend's events would not have happened, or at the very least, I don't think they'd be happening in Tucson. So as photographers and connoisseurs of photography, we all know that wonderful things happen when three dimensions get translated into two. However, I'd like to take a moment to move in the other direction by adding the dimension of time back into that community map. For the line that concludes at the School of Art projects straight across that axis, and if we trace its trajectory 40 years into the future, we see a photography program that is thriving. Um, I will note that like many photography programs, uh, it exists in a basement. <laughs> But it's a different basement than the one it existed in when Harold came. <laughs> and we're working on that. We're going to elevate photography out of the basement, as it were. Uh, I was literally in the process of working on these remarks when I learned that two of the five recipients of the 2020 Society for Photographic Education Student Award for Innovations in Imaging had gone to MFA students in our program. The program is currently ranked in the top 10 nationally and populated with a community of students and faculty doing absolutely amazing and innovative work. Um, it's complemented also by an equally exciting program dedicated explicitly to the history of photography. Both of these programs maintain a close connection to the center. Our students work here as interns or even in some cases as full-time employees after they graduate. <laughs> they do research in the archives and they benefit from the broad range of programming the center offers. Our faculty work closely with CCP staff, coordinate on programming, and often directly benefit from utilizing the archive in their own work. Our proximity to such a unique resource has been an ongoing boon to the program and certainly contributed to its success. We've also continued to realize the potential of photography as a catalyst for interdisciplinarity, an idea that was a founding tenant of the center. Our students and faculty work broadly across disciplines here at the university, from the sciences to the humanities to the social sciences, and, they work, and the work they produce is unequivocally stronger for it. It has been a great experience, I have to say, uncovering the history of the program in preparation for this morning's events, and in so, do, in so doing, realizing that so much of what we've become is part of our, des our DNA, present since the program's inception. And so I want to end this morning by describing another map of sorts. During his work on Voices of Photography, Harold kept a whiteboard in the space where he worked. On that whiteboard was a continuously evolving vision for photo education, especially with respect to the study of the language of photography. Um, and I should pause here to note that much to my chagrin, I didn't discover the presence of this whiteboard until after I met with Harold earlier this week. Consequently, I have not had a chance to talk to him so if I get this completely wrong, my apologies in advance, but here goes anyway. 
The vision depicts a whole host of ideas and inputs, all converging from different directions and ultimately aligning into a single trajectory labeled simply the life of the photograph. At this point of convergence, a single word is prominently written in all capital letters, wonder. I feel confident in saying that a sense of wonder is alive and well in the school. Of, so Harold, on behalf of the School of Art, congratulations um, on this well-deserved recognition and thank you. Do you feel loved? <laughs> I'm just an old, whoa. <laughs> I'm just an old hippie guy from New Jersey. It, can, I, can I add something to that? But Harold once told me, and I assume it is true, that when he was young, his mother did not approve of trips to New York because she sent to Manhattan because she felt it was a center of evil. <laughs> so much for that theory. So, so as we've all tried to do a little bit of research, um, I had I was in touch with um, the dear people here at the center to please send me some uh, information on Harold's early life. And um, Harold, I found out you might have been a baseball fan at one time. Be, because there's there's evidence of you gluing some baseball stats or standings into a page of a book. There's a picture of you as a baby announcing that you're the fourth generation to be born into your family in this country. Your mom looks just like Frankie. It's, no, but, but it's unusual to find a beauty as beautiful as Frankie. So, so, and then the third one was like this, this, I think it was a high school yearbook picture, and it said something like, gone to get my tooth fixed. <laughs> so that's, that's it, and Cavalier Catchum brought up a great point earlier today, that we need to set up a, a, a vehicle through which we can all, or you can all, as I've said enough, you can all share some knowledge of Harold's early life, because we know light and after, thank God, but we need to know before light, where the hell did you come from? You know, Cavalier and I were talking about, maybe you did just land here from Mars. But I, you know. Okay, so we'll work. So now we just have two more parts to this. And they should be, uh, one should be painless and the other should be a lot of fun. And the lot of fun part is now because Harold's gonna have to come up here. Um, we have, Andy and I have a couple things to, to present to you. Yeah, do you, do you think you, why don't you? <laughs> this is my grandfather, and he, he'd like to come and say a few words. He, do, he, he, he doesn't speak English. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet, he's, learn, he's, he's practicing, but he wants to say a few words. My grandfather's name is Alfred. He can't see in this country. You know that? Yes. Yes. Harold. You. Yes. Your grandmother and I are very proud of you. <laughs> we never thought you'd amount to anything. And, well, so far, so good. <laughs> I think that's in my ear. As, as we say in the old country, mazel tov. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, wait, wait, wait. wait. Oh, oh. In Eastern. Okay. You, go ahead. you want me to go first? Where would you like me to go? Stand? You come uh, right here. Right there. Right here. Right here. You want to dance? And then after the second part of this, you, you take it away. There's but you have to look at everybody. Two parts. The second part. Okay. Already scared. Oh, look at that. I know. <laughs> okay. All right, you ready? So um, I, I am. Rest for, uh, can I come back? 
No, remember the other day I told you you had to be at the film screen? Oh, you're the boss. You're the yeah, yes, okay, yes. so yeah, you're, you're doing good. Okay, so um, we at the center are very happy to announce that there will be a tree planted right, right out front um, in Harold's honor. And, um, yes. Amy, you're not bad. That's very good. What kind of tree? May I ask what kind of tree? Do so you know what kind of tree? I knew, I knew oh. you would ask that. And, and I, I knew you would ask what kind of tree, and I wanted to remind you of the bureaucracy here at the University of Arizona. <laughs> so um, we are working very hard with the facilities and planning and uh, people that are um, in, in charge of horticulture ecology. and ecology yeah. and, uh, yeah, department. arid lands. Arid land. um, so basically, I... If I had to put money on it, I would say a Palo Verde or a Mesquite. No, both good choices. Yeah, yeah. So here, oh. and, and here, this is for you to take home. It says, Harold's Tree. And the tree is planted in honor of Harold Jones, founding director of the Center for Creative Photography. So if you may, we could take a minute. Could all the people who ever worked at or for Light Gallery please stand up? Come on, I know you're out there. Don't be bad. Right, see, not a lot, but you're there. Right. Okay. I accept this award on behalf <laughs> of us. All right? To us. So this is... This is our tree. Yeah? Thank you. There's a little something more. Yeah, there's no, something there's more. A little Wait, something. There's more. Do I get like a horse or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. The, the, the committee it would Can take I come to back get to a Portland? horse would be years in the making. Yeah. Okay. All right. There's more. There's oh, more, more, more. And is this. Okay. So. I don't. So. so we were on the phone one day, not too terribly long ago. Like, what do you get Harold? And so we talked about it and, and thought about it. And so there are a few people here who know what this is, but I'm gonna hold it up so everybody can, can see, and perhaps you can guess it. If you can see it, don't weigh in. It's um, cashmere and wool. It says light, CCP, and U of A. Can anybody guess what this is? Hat? Yeah, I know. You're disqualified. You're disqualified. You're disqualified. It, a bow tie holder. Okay. Any other thoughts? Family can't weigh in. You got it. So it's hard to know what to get Harold. So we had this dog sweater made for his beloved beast who won the battle. Lulu. This is for Lulu. Uh, Lulu. Commemorating three parts of Harold's life and his career. When we called our friend who makes sweaters, she said, what? <laughs> I think she did pretty well. They, Lulu, may I say a few more words? Yeah, this is, you can, now, go. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna not say a lot. You can say, yeah, try that, Harold, those of you who know me. First of all, thank you, Center, Annie, crew, over here. Thank you for your continual and evolving work at the Center. Because that's the cool thing, it's evolving. It's not the same. Thank you for that. That's what will keep it alive. Okay, I want you all to be aware that Sunday, today, tomorrow, is Hippolyte Bayard's birthday. <laughs> now, Hippolyte Bayard, thank you, thank you, good start. Hippolyte Bayard is, of course, the first expressive photographer. If you don't know Hippolyte Bayard's work, please look for it. Look for as many pictures as you can, because if you're here, if you're over there. So later, before we leave today, we will sing happy birthday to Hippolyte Bayard. <laughs> Okay, 
The second thing I really feel I have to share with you is I've been made aware that a woman found in her aunt's closet, her aunt used to take care of Michael Bishop, one of the great ones. And if you see my desk, in the, my, um, my faux desk, or is that the right term? Uh, on the bulletin board is a picture by a uh, note from Michael Bishop, very, really important. Uh, they were all my favorites, but he was a favorite among favorites. A woman has discovered in her aunt's closet a box of 200 Michael Bishop prints. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is really a rare, rare find, an opportunity. Uh, I, uh, and thousands of slides, which is, but the prints. So if you're interested in this, to go further, I'll give you the name of the person who has them. I don't want to get in the middle. And <laughs> one thing about being retired is I found I'm a really, really crummy correspondent. And lastly, the person that really helped me do a lot of this is my dear Francis. Come on up. Greetings, everyone. And I just have to say, this has been a brilliant, brilliant event. And I cannot thank Annie and her staff for putting this together and for wonderful Fern and her family. And I'm thrilled here to have our daughters, Star and Becky, the twins. And please come up. And yeah, come on. my. Come on. Come on. Come My, on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> uh, McKenna and Klein, McKenna, McKenna Marie Klein, who has the creative juice of an artist running through her blood, and I'm thrilled about that. And McKenna and I will awful often go out and about, and we'll take pictures together. She'll take pictures of me. I'll take pictures of her. And that is the most beautiful thing about photography. And I think finally what I want to say is, Harold is the love of my life, has always been the love of my life, and he taught me how to see. So thank you all for being here and for celebrating light and your love of photography, and may we all pay it forward. And have a plan B. And a plan This is the um, necessary but should be painless part. We're, we're going to ask you all, to the extent you care to, to contribute to the um, Harold Jones and Francis Murray endowment here at the center. Um, endowments are important because endowments secure legacy. Legacy is important because it spreads the word. Um, there are a couple models that, that have taught me that I think can be used here, and that is that when Robert Rauschenberg died, to say the least, he left a lot of material behind. That material was gone through, sorted out, and parceled out to institutions around the world. That work was given, but with the proviso that it be used, studied, talked about, whatever they could come up with, by these various institutions every three years, five years, or ten years, whatever they could arrange, so that Rauschenberg could be thought about and talked about. The Harold Jones and Francis Murray Endowment encourages people to come here and use the center. Are you surprised that that's what their endowment is about? I don't think anybody should be surprised. Um, Here. <laughs> 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 
Uh oh. Uh oh. I lost the names. I'm so sorry. No, no, I got the names. Come on up here. Um. You're going to have to help me with your name. It's Christopher Herbert and my wife, Nancy Welch, who are not here. Christopher and his wife, Nancy, have kindly given generously to the fund. Susan and I have given some seed money to the fund. And we have a challenge that we'll, we will each put in another $1,000. So it's $2,000 today if five other people will match the $1,000 a piece. I'm not going to ask people to stand up, raise their arms, or anything, <laughs> but somehow make the pledge and fulfill it, please. We also have a lot to learn, I've got to be careful, yeah. Yeah. from Bernie Sanders, who has developed a way of raising money. It's not how much you give, it's how many of you give. So the, the, the center is set up to receive funds variously in various amounts um, from you all, should you care to contribute. And as we see from Bernie's incredible success in fundraising, that's another way to give. So we'd love to leave this room today in this part of the celebration will be the fact that we have this opportunity and responsibility to help keep things going and to um, give money to support this wonderful endowment. I am not Jerry Lewis, but, but try, try your best to um, open your wallets and give generously, okay? So thank you, and my apologies. Uh, yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, uh, the, our, our kind of modest endowment is meant to support research. Research here, whether it's done by an eighth grader or a PhD person, is really important. So that's what we want. I'm not so short. <laughs> You're taller than me. Everybody's, but everybody's taller than me. All right. <laughs> Don't leave. If I can kindly ask everybody to just stay right where you are, we're going to take a photograph. Imagine that. Hi, everyone. Please join us in the lobby for the reception. You read my mind. You are the last one. 